Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. And if you were here yesterday, thank you for coming again. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Christina Favreau, who is the Director of Academic Programs over at Monty Tech. Um, saying, can you guys see? Like, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just want to make sure. Um, so same as yesterday, she will tell you a little bit about herself and then please feel free. Don't be shy. Ask questions. So I guess I'll start by just sharing a little about myself, if that's OK. Um, I started off in education as a teacher. Uh, I taught for 11 years uh, English. I was uh, an English department chair my third year uh, until I left. Uh, I was a teacher at a comprehensive district, traditional K-12 district. Um, and, and that was rewarding, um, but I was looking for more vocational. I have always supported vocational education and I really wanted to work in vocational education. So an opportunity came up at Monty Tech, which was in my district. And I applied for that position and I was lucky enough to get in. That was 14 years ago. Um, and since then, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to do a lot of things. Um, things like uh, renovating six science labs, renovating the, the, the main library that was done in my first year there. Uh, we started that project uh, with, the, with the idea that it was going to be the hub for both the academics uh, and the vocational side. We needed to make sure that we serviced both and that it was a hub for the kids and that we also uh, had resources for teachers and staff as well. Uh, and so I'm very proud of that. Um, we've done a lot of renovating throughout the years. I've also had an opportunity to work with colleges and universities to build and bring in new programs. Uh, we brought in Project Lead the Way. I worked with the engineering teachers on that program. Uh, we brought in science uh, project lead the way courses, two of them. Uh, we also did not have an AP program, so we brought in 10 courses in the 14 years that I've been there. Um, and I say we because I didn't do that alone. I partnered with each teacher, any teacher who was willing to go to the trainings to find out more about it, if they were interested in doing it, that's where we started. <clears throat> I think your teachers are your best resource uh, and, you, and you need to work together in order to make your program stronger. With that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes. So superintendency is a really big job. What's the most exciting thing to think about yourself in that? Or what you bring to the organization, what it does for you professionally? Can you just speak to that? Sure. I think the job of the superintendent is to help the school district become a resource, a hub for the community. Uh, and that includes a lot of different parts. And so I think the, the main job is to create access, uh, to connect people together, to connect a teacher with a resource, to connect uh, the parents with the community itself, uh, to educate, to um, share what we do, what we do as vocational educators. Um, and, and I think it's exciting when you become a district that is the main resource for your area, you're sending your member towns, uh, you're the place to go for training. You're the place to go to send your children. Uh, you know when your kids graduate, they are gonna be able uh, to make that choice of right into career or into college. Uh, they'll be ready and they'll have had the experience here uh, in order to make that decision. Hi, why do you want to work at Minuteman? So I think in, in deciding to be a superintendent, I think uh, for me, I, I really think it's important having, having worked for 10, I was counting them on the way here, 10 different superintendents. I want to make sure that when I become a superintendent, that the place that I choose and that chooses me, that it's a good match. And, and I think that is so critical. And I think sometimes people just want to be a superintendent because they want to be a superintendent. Uh, for me, I want to be a superintendent in a district that is similar to what I know and what I love. Um, and this school district is very similar to Monty Tech, where I've worked for almost 15 years. And I think it's, it's similar in similar shops, 
It's similar in the culture. It's similar in their dedication to the programs. Um, it's about half the size of Money Tech. I feel like it's a really great uh, school. And what I've heard and what I've seen, you know, it's it's a great school. And and I would love to work here. Is it 10 superintendents in 15 years? I've been in education for 25 years. Yeah. There's a whole 25 years you've had 10 superintendents. Yes, yes. Um, in two different districts. Um, and both of those districts were in the same community. So yeah, 10. And that includes interims. <laughs> I think in that time you get to see a lot of things that, a lot of decisions that work well and some that don't, and, and you learn from those. Can you give us an example of decisions that work well and the decisions that didn't? Yeah. Um, I worked for a superintendent who, when it came to budget, he was excellent. He uh, was meticulous. But he, it was very important in our community. So when I first was a teacher, I lived in the town that I was teaching in, and that community did not have a lot of money for overrides and other things. That superintendent was able to get two overrides through um, that were meaningful and important. But the way that he did it uh, was partnering with the community, talking with the guys at the Cumberland Farms, uh, the town workers that go there every morning, um, getting out there and making the connections with the people, answering their questioning, their questions, listening to their concerns, listening to understand what their concerns really were. It, it wasn't top down. It was more for understanding and how, you know, he was, he was explaining how this was going to be better for the community. Uh, and he was successful in that. There have been superintendents that I've worked for who have that top-down approach, um, who want to come in and they want to make their mark. They want to make decisions based on what, solely on what they think is best. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a while to get to know the community, to get to know the towns that feed into the school community, um, to know if staff is ready for certain changes, like a change in your student information system, that's a pretty huge shift. Um, I think it's it's about culture, and you really have to have your finger on that before you're making any quick changes. So, so I would say that is the exact opposite how I am. Yes. Um, how would a staff member that works under you describe you? Um, well, I I think first that I learn. Uh, as much as I can about whatever it is, the program it is that, for example, we're going to talk about their program. Um, they would they would definitely say that I I know my data. I uh, I think they would also say that I care very much about my staff. I think that's important. Uh, a staff member that lost their parent last week, um, you know, following up with them, making sure they're okay. I mean, we're all people, we're all humans, we all have lives. Um, it's important that you're connected to your staff, that you're not just in your office. Like making those connections, as a superintendent, you're making connections outside the district. A lot of your time is outside, but it's just as important that you're connecting within. Um, and so all of my staff would say that I'm dedicated. They would all say that I love my job and that I'm passionate about what I do. I have three boys, um, and they all went to vocational school. They all went to Money Tech, um, and that I think shows uh, how much I believe in vocational education. Uh, they are all in their 20s and 30s now. Um, my youngest is just getting ready to graduate, and that's very time. I'm very excited for that. So we are empty nesters, um, and uh, we have the dog, of course, still, but, uh, but I um a different time in my life and I have time now to do some of the things that I'm passionate about and I think every one of my staff members would say I spent way too much time at the school I'm typically one of the last to leave 
Um, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm dedicated, I'm ready. Um, I think shifting from one district to another, uh, I did that once before when I went from Narragansett to Huntington. Um, it's, it's a lot to learn uh, everything you can about the new community and learn uh, and meet everyone and learn uh, what they care about and what uh, moves them about Minuteman, Monitor, whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, but I have the time to do that and, and I'm dedicated and I'm ready. Yes. Can you talk about a high point in your career and um, maybe also a low point in perhaps what you learned for and how those experiences might inform you going forward? I think. I think one of the first experiences that I had at Ronnie Tech that surprised me, um, that informed me, was when I went to a school committee meeting uh, and the mayor of one of the sending towns came and, and told us that we should be ashamed of ourselves for providing AP courses and Project Lead the Way and advanced courses. And that surprised me so much because I knew that some of the community uh, were listening to the arguments that vocational schools should not be providing advanced courses and that it should just be the comprehensive schools and that uh, the vocational schools should just be doing their shops and that's it. Um, and part of that conversation was about how many of our shops require college after. Um, and how important it was that we provide and meet kids where they are. And that means support, providing support, Title I and ESL and those things. But it also means providing the advanced classes for the English, math, and science that the kids. So those kids can have those opportunities, just like everyone else. The only thing that's really different from, from a vocational school and a comprehensive, really, should be your vocational programs. Because that's what, that's what they are. Um, one of the one of the best things I've gotten to do is renovate six labs, six science labs. Uh, the grants that we've been able to to get um, and work with those teachers, um, Mass Life Science grants. We've been able to get several of those over the past few years, um, and then bring in Project Lead the Way. We brought in a microbiology college prep class. Uh, we partnered with colleges and universities uh, in order to bring in a biotech and a biology dual enrollment class. So we really have expanded um, our science labs and partnered with, with uh, different organizations in order for that to happen. So that's, I'm definitely very, very proud of that. And the kids for Jennifer, for quite a long time, will be able to access those science labs and the library uh, and our new vet tech center as well. So it's very exciting. Yes. Can you tell us what your thoughts are for rentals and what's complex and things like that? We also have four structures on this project. Have you thought about what you have? What would your thoughts be to rental? So, I mean, we just toured them. Oh, so yeah. I got to see them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think they're all great opportunity. Uh, one of my questions on the tour was, you know, and what do the teachers think about potential for exploring uh, any part of their program, using it for, you know, how can we be resourceful with any of our programs and using it? Um, what, what your plans are for the vet tech building is incredible. Uh, and that seems very exciting. Um, and you're temporarily relocating, you know, while that happens. I think that's very resourceful. I come from a district that had no money, right? My original years, we had no money. And um, anytime, I, it's just how I'm built. If there is a way for us to be resourceful um, in order to maximize the resources that we have, then, then we should look at that for sure. Um, whether it's leasing it out or renting it out to a family, um, and, you know, and, and they're well-maintained, and you can certainly do that. Um, uh, or looking at other opportunities, I think it's important. I don't think I, it doesn't seem like a good idea to sell them. And also a huge bonus that the kids and the teachers built them and you know, worked on them. So it's great. I, 
Hey, how would you describe your leadership style? Uh, so, like I said, I'm not a top down, even though I'm the academic director. Um, I treat everybody like an equal, and, and I think that's really important. We're all people. Um, my team, I call my, I have my team in the front office. I have a secretary and a data accountability person. We all work together, we're a team. And the whole hallway, we're a team. All my teachers, we're a team. Um, and so somebody has a good idea, it does not need to be my idea. Um, the idea can come from anywhere. Is it valid? Is there data to support it? Is this something we should explore? We work together. Team. Um, administratively, when you become a superintendent, people want to know how will you work with your administrative team. Uh, I, I think one way for me to explain that is for the, the past eight years, I've been the statewide director of MAVA Academic Curriculum Directors Group. And in eight years, in that eight years, we originally started by having two or three meetings a year. Um, and my approach to that was, what do they need? How can we be more resourceful? I set the agenda, but everyone is treated the same. We are all, you know, just looking for strategies and resources and ways to get through whatever we're getting, we're getting through. Is someone else doing it better? Great. Explain how you're doing it. Why are you happy with it? Why, why do you have these science classes in this order? Why is that the way that you're doing it? Um, why do you have a cell phone policy? Um, what about Title I? How are you writing your grants? You know, all of these resources, these, these different ways to do things. Um, and so for the, when we approached COVID, um, I think that was just, you know, having them through that, it was a really challenging time for everyone. And for the next two years, I decided to have those meetings every week because they needed support, right? They needed to bounce their ideas off of others. Uh, who were trying some of these things in the classrooms. What are you doing for your hybrid system? What are you doing, you know, in the classroom? What are you doing for your technology? How are you, um, your instructional technology? What are you doing there? Are you using your Chromebooks or security, safety? How is that working? All of those, those things. It was just really a hub for us to just see what each other was doing, who needs a resource, we'll create a folder, you can look at it at any time, I'll send you this, do you have letters for this? It was just a great resource. And I, and I feel like the admin team is the same. We'll meet every, I'll assume we'll meet every, every week, um, whatever the routine is. Um, typically we, we meet every week. Um, we talk about our district initiatives, uh, questions, concerns about whatever. Everyone is an equal member at that table and should Feel trusted and able to share their thoughts. Do you write your own grants? Are you a grant writer? Yep. So I don't do the competitive CTI grants, um, but I do all the Title I, Title IIA, Title IV, SOA, or Student Opportunity Act. Um, and I collaborate with all of the teachers on all of those things that come from Title I, for example. The Title I grant is about $250,000. And so that money goes toward uh, a variety of things, including teacher coaches, uh, teacher support, um, training, technology, also data teams. Data teams was uh, something that <clears throat> was not at Money Tech when I first got there. Um, and we needed to take a closer look at how our kids were doing, our, our underachieving students, our more challenged students, our high needs kids, and see why they aren't achieving. And we need to invest time in teachers and, and support staff in order to get them there. Um, and we've grown that data team. I was, uh, I was able to start that data team with volunteers without paying them. Because the first year, I don't know if you know how Title I works, but you get you, you, your first year and then uh, you spend it uh, throughout the year um, and uh, when I was hired it wasn't uh, it was already written so that that first year I got uh, a lead a teacher leader who was very invested uh, to go to a, a data training and um, and then she reached out to a couple of people and and now we're at 15 members and we analyze MCAS uh, we've shifted also to include common assessments every single term um, and they analyze that for our Title I kids. 
um, and provide best practices, suggestions for the departments when they report back. Uh, and it's been really helpful to the departments, to the kids. Uh, it's been a great program for them. So you have a lot of innovative ways of bringing in money. Um, we have the normal ones, taxes, my taxes, you know, those friendlies, yeah. um, and grants, and all the fundraising they do through the building, renting the building itself. Um, what other, are there things that you're doing that you can bring here that we don't have? And I'm not sure I know all the things we have here, but you don't know? Yeah, yeah. I think I don't know all the things that you have either, you know, but learning uh, all the things that you do have and and certainly my background, uh, you know, I'll be pulling from, you know, hey, we could try this. We could try that. I know this resource. I know this person. You know, I think my resources are a big part in in what could be helpful to Minuteman. Um, I know. I hate to pick anything specific. But yeah, budget cuts, like paper towels got taken away. Yeah. It was really helpful. Yeah, you know? it's hard. It's hard when you're in a in a in a town that, that struggles to pay uh, for the, the assessments. Uh, I think if you start with an approach of efficiencies, when you're looking at your resources, your programs, each year I evaluate my Title I funds because I have to redo it. Um, when I evaluate it, I'm looking for maybe we can get the same thing done only differently and save more money. Maybe we can, so we look at the programs. We look at, like right now we're revamping our, our freshman academy, our summer freshman academy. Years ago, that was started um, in order to give uh, additional support uh, for kids who, who struggle. Um, it was a two-week program for incoming freshmen. Uh, and, and this year, we were able to open it up to all the kids, all freshmen, not just a select few. Um, so looking at those efficiencies, I think, is really important, not just when it's budget season, not just when, oh, it's going to be a tight year, but all the time, you know, um, looking at your staff, listening to your staff as far as what is working, you know, what equipment do they need? Can we write a grant? You know, can we write for the science department for Mass Life Science Grant? You know, it, it all comes from your needs assessment, your evaluation, but also with the mindset of efficiencies. Yes. Uh, do you have any experience working uh, with the union? And if so, <laughs> if there was ever a time where there wasn't an agreement right off the bat, how did that, how did that work out? It yeah, so in my district, typically the superintendents and the business <laughs> manager do the direct negotiating. Um, so in the room, I have not had that particular experience. But when we did the educator evaluation system, when that first came out, um, uh, I was on that team. And so we put together a, a team of a few um, administrators and a few of the union reps and we worked on how you know to negotiate these impact bargainness uh, and that was a great learning process um, and I think if you have good relationships with teachers um, <clears throat> in my experience from what I've seen if you don't have that and you're going to have a lot of problems in the negotiation process so a lot of that, that stuff can be resolved if you work on your relationships and you make sure that you have good relationships with people. Um, I did, uh, I do, I currently, since since that ad, 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 uh, negotiation process, um, we created a joint labor committee and that committee uh, has been active since then. I think that was 2015, 14, 15 or so. Um, and we just negotiated again uh, a shift in our, uh, we're adopting the new rubric, um, teaching rubric, um, and we wanted to partner with teachers to make the process less stressful. We found that um, we had adopted the binder process, and so the evidence collection was very cumbersome for teachers, and I think unnecessarily so. 
Um, I can see a lot of this stuff when I walk through the classroom. <coughs> I better understand it if I have a conversation with a teacher and say, well, how are you assessing me on X, whatever, whatever it is? Um, are you using a variety? What variety are you using? Can you give me yeah. examples? When I go in and I do an observation, what is the assessment for this week? Is there something in particular you're assessing them on? Let me take a look at it. Like there's things that you can do that you learn along the way. Teacher doesn't need to come, you know, with a binder that's this thick of um, all the things that they do, especially when they know they're going to do. So, um, so we have developed uh, a pretty good relationship that that process of shifting the rubric was a yes, and then shifting um, to no binder, we're going to do meetings instead, and evidence if we need to. And I think teachers feel a, a huge burden lifted. Um, and I think it's going to end up in a better result. So I think just supports the relationships with your teachers, you know, and, and, and the process itself does include that evaluation process. So for me, when I first started teaching, I think I was teaching three years and the principal came to me and said, can you uh, um, step up and, and be the department chair? Department chair is leaving. Um, and I said, yeah, we have a lot more to learn. And he said, no, I don't, I don't think, I think you're good. You really want to be the department. And I said, well, how is it going to work for the observations and the evaluations? And he said, well, they're, you know, you're in the same union as them, but you're going to do it. And so that's what I did. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to observe and evaluate like my mentor did. I wanted to do it differently. I wanted to be a mentor. I didn't want people to be afraid of me when I came into the classroom. I want to partner with teachers. I want to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And if they're going <clears throat> to help them, I want to help them. And that's kind of how we do Yes. So Minutemen is going to be hiring a principal next year, our assistant director that stepped into that role, which we know is yes. amazing. Um, so when you hire a new principal, what are the qualities that you need? Yeah, I have, what, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna draw on my prior experiences as far as what I know works, um, but I, I think my, I, I currently work with uh, a principal who's amazing. She, um, she has the people skills, right? She is the front of the house. The parents come in and they meet her. Uh, the kids come in, she's engaging, she's talking mm -hmm. with them. Um, she is uh, friendly and kind and she is your advocate no matter what you need. I think that's really important. Um, I also think the behind the scenes matters as well. You have to be a doer. You have to do your job. And I've worked with some who have not, and that is really hard on staff. Uh, it's important that you are working with staff on different initiatives, of course, but that you're also seen as a partner, uh, that you're not just with staff when you need staff. So I think someone who has both of those skills is going to be a great asset to the district. Yes. <coughs> Superintendent has to deal with going out to nine different communities that have very different day jobs. What is your experience with town meeting and all that lovely river all that goes about? Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you mean? My experience has been great. <laughs> so, I mean, starting from the very beginning, from a, a parent's perspective, and as a, a resident, as a homeowner, uh, you know, living in the town of Templeton for as many years as I did. Uh, going to those meetings was very challenging. And I'll say it took them 25 years to build a new school. And that was with a lot of work and a lot of misdirection and a lot of frustration. Um, so as a, as a member of, town, uh, of a town like that, I can see the challenges. Um, also, I think people are fighting for, you know, their, what they have. And they know when the prices go up, for education, yes, it's an important thing to invest in, but also it hurts their, their pocket. Um, and so I understand that. Um, from a parent's perspective, um, living in the community that I work in, 
uh, has had a tremendous impact um, because I'm able to talk to people, my friends, their friends, uh, anybody that, uh, any community event, but my experience in vocation. And why do you think this? And why do you think that? To listen about what their concerns really are and making sure there isn't this misinformation. Um, several times, uh, the superintendent has asked me to fill in at town meeting uh, to talk about budget or answer budget questions if needed. Uh, and so that's been an interesting process. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to learn. Um, and, and I think that should be the end, the town meeting process. The beginning of that whole budget process starts early on. Partnering with those representatives is really important. Uh, listening to what they're saying and trying to understand and, and how can we meet them uh, with their needs? Um, how can we better understand what their situation is? You have to have compassion for the sending districts, especially if they can't afford what we're asking them to do um, and try to understand uh, you know, the situation before you're advocating for anything they, they, they just can't support. Um, and I think in my job in general, we have so many parent events with parent and student events all of the time. Uh, we have you know, orientation, like parent orientation, we have student orientation, we have open house, uh, career orientation night, uh, career awareness, um, back to school night, uh, welcome freshman, freshman night. And we do, it's so important that the school is having, bringing the community in as much as you can, it's really important especially if your goal is for the school to be a resource uh, for the community. You, 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 your job as a superintendent is to make sure that these things are those opportunities. Does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Hello. Uh, in terms of student achievement, how do you um, come in on the, um, on, the um, like on the spectrum of Equal opportunity for all students or equal outcome? Uh, well, I will say that my sole job, uh, my priority role since the very beginning has been to how are we going to get the, the scores up, right? We have to get the scores up. We, we need to be doing, number one, we need to beat the state average, right? So I have these tools. Uh, available to me that I can access, uh, just need to be careful and do it the right way, right? So I worked with teachers, you know, we partnered together to strengthen our Title One program. What are we doing? What are we offering? Are the teachers who are teaching these courses, are, are do they have access to the, the best curriculum and the best tools that they need? Um, teacher coaches. So this year was our first year we were able to expand teacher coaches to the social studies department. What a great idea. Right, they, they, they're doing their common assessments as well, um, but there's no test, uh, no MCAS test for them, but they're still doing assessments, right? We can still be, you know, providing them a resource uh, and looking at their data and, and seeing if we can maybe get our writing scores up if we include some writing in their curriculum or their critical thinking, um, just taking a look at their assessments. So it's been a, a huge piece. Um, other things like I had this great ESL teacher who uh, comes to me, shuts the door and says, I'm so frustrated, this isn't happening in the classroom, this needs to be happening, and it's okay, so let's troubleshoot, what can we do? Um, we, we, we decided that he was going to do a professional development training um, <laughs> in December, and what he wanted to do was do it with the Spanish-speaking teacher, and he wanted that teacher to speak the lesson in Spanish. Right, so the lesson was in uh, science, um, and he spoke it in Spanish. And the teachers who signed up for it, there were ten of them, approximately, um, and they had no idea what he was saying. And then uh, the teacher stood up and said, "Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the strategies that you can use in your classrooms that might help a, a student who's learning English as a second language." And so then the Spanish teacher redid the lesson with the supports that he had laid out, and those teachers learned new tools that they left with, and then they started using immediately after after that day. It was really uh, an effective, uh, and I think it just 
It underscores uh, how we use our resources. Um, we have excellent teachers in the building who have all of these great skills. Why are we hiring someone from the outside to come in and teach our, our teachers? I don't know how many of you have sat in a training that has been completely useless, but that does happen from time to time, and that is frustrating, right? It's frustrating. So you can't be doing, you can't do things like that unless you do it with your teachers. You need to get to know your teachers, build relationships with them, encourage them, right? Get them to come out of their classroom, maybe do a professional development or some other teachers who could be learning some of those great things and applying them in their classrooms as well. Any other questions? Yes. I'm trying to formulate one, but you just said something that, that we should always be trying to be better than average, like higher than average achievement. Isn't that what I heard? No, no, no. So, so my goal always in supporting teachers is that they are the best that they can be. Uh, I think I was referring to the state, the state's test scores and trying to get for students for students to get right to get our scores up to or at least and up to the state average exceed the state average i think just in general you're you want to be the state average um you want the kids you know to perform sure. well so they you know it it's it's so so many of our kids are doing b-tests this week it's a struggle mm -hmm. and so they want them to, to do well that's what i meant right because i guess what it makes me think about is we have many kids who are very high needs and we have a very high population of kids who need a lot of extra support and we get a lot of kids who come here as freshmen functioning well below average yeah and the fact that we get them to average is an extraordinary feat so i just question and hope what we look at as what's excellent here, oftentimes you have to look at where the students starting when they first arrive here at Minnie. So 100%. And so that's why, and, and I'm going back to the question earlier, uh, when you're looking at accountability results, um, you know, when I looked at my results, I went straight to our high needs kids because we have a lot of those too. You guys have a much higher night, uh, number than we do. Um, but that's where I go because that's those are our kids who struggle the most, right? Your high needs are going to be in more than one category, right? It's poverty or you know it's, it's reading disability or whatever it might be. Um, and I can track the data that shows that those kids are growing at an accelerated rate, and that feels good, right? And the teachers get that information, and they know, you know, that their hard work pays off. Uh, I think you meet the kids where they are, and they, you know, they grow, and that's the goal, right? So I probably didn't say that the right. No, way. I just want to make sure yes. I heard you correctly. Yeah. Also, one hundred percent, I agree with you. Can you comment that like it takes a little while to kind of learn the new district and how you should you need to have a relationship with teachers? How would you go about doing so? Where you start? Well, I think for me, uh, names. As I get older, it's hard to remember names with faces. Um, and so I found uh, that as I started, I've hired a lot of people uh, in, in my current job. Um, and I always say to them, get a yearbook. That helps start the process to help you so that when you see a person, you can, you know their name, right? You're a science teacher, you, you know, it helps you to remember them. Um, I, I think you, you need to, you know, it's important to know the difference between your job, the superintendent's job, and the principal's job. You're not you know, going to see them every single day. You're not going to see staff every single day. But it is important to be visible, to be accessible, to have an open door policy. Now, there will be times where I won't be available in meetings and that sort of thing. Um, but it's still important for me by, you know, morning duty in the morning, I'm probably going to want to be hanging out in, in front of saying hello to staff and kids in the morning because that's something that I do every day. Uh, I think that's important, uh, greeting people, um, seeing people in the hallway. But then, if there's an, an initiative that we're doing, or if I want to learn more about plumbing, um, if we have an opportunity to write a grant, we're going to want to talk to some teachers who might be interested in, in, in strengthening their programs and their equipment. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of 90 days, 90 meetings, you know, a lot of gimmicky kind of stuff out there. I, I'm going to have as many meetings as I can when I start so that I can meet everyone. I, I think what's hard is the July 1st start. Everyone's on vacation. So I don't get an opportunity to meet everyone, you know, like it was at the start. Um, but it's good, you know, to start with the staff that are in the building um, and in the local community, the sending community, if you call it the member towns. Um, so I will be setting up as many meetings as I possibly can so that I can really learn. Um, I think I, to, to really understand the culture, to understand um, each department, uh, each teacher, kind of how things, an idea of the rhythm of how, how the building works. So it's a priority. It's just takes some Anyone else? Okay, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank you.